Good morning, Ryan, Ryan fans, and welcome to the uh, live remote handling demonstration event that uh, I'm sure you're all excited to see. Oh, no, I am. It's going to be a stellar event. Um, we're joined, actually, with a live studio audience, kind of like Happy Days uh, vibe, which is nice. Um, hey, brilliant. This is good. This is cheering. Round of applause, anyone? Just, uh, hey, this is good. This is good. So the main applause will obviously be saved for the demonstrations that we're going to do. Um, which is a, as a quick note and for everyone here as well, uh, just a, as a thank you for joining. You're all geniuses for being here because this is a truly unique event. It's not just because today, you know, 22nd of September, etc. But this combination of people, this specific technology run, the uh, potential success or whatever the outcome is, that, that only happen, happens once, right? So you're a uh, bona fide genius for joining us for this session. Um, if you need to blink, do it now. You're not going to want to uh, miss anything we're sharing. Um, as a quick uh, sanity check, we've got everyone online. Thank you for viewing live and a quick hello for everyone who's viewing later. Um, where I'm going to be looking, so we've got studio audience here. I'll be looking down to the workshop on the right, so I'm not ignoring everyone who's online. Uh, a quick overview. So what is Ryan? Obviously, there's the branding behind. So it's uh, robotics and AI for nuclear. Um, it started four years ago, and if you're late to the party, where have you been? It's all good. We're all happy to have you here. Um, Rain started in October 2017, so nearly four years ago. And phase one was the initial kind of um, rollout for Rain. And the ambition was to do lots of things. I've only got a short time, but basically bring lots of things together in the, the robotics and AI sector for nuclear, recognizing that it needed to bring together the industrial audience from nuclear, as well as the, uh, the academic teams and the supply chain to bring it all together so that it wasn't just a case of bringing academic ideas together and then leave them languish on the shelf because there's no advantage there. So the real core and drive for Ryan was this industrial benefit in being able to get things out into environments. So as a quick example, so today is obviously a laboratory-based, a workshop-based demonstration, but through Ryan we've done different on-site demonstrations, primarily through remote inspection, which I'll cover in a second. So RAIN was part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, ISCF, one of the many acronyms you'll come across. Uh, and RAIN was set up and runs with, now with 10 institutions, um, a mixture of academic and uh, hybrid organizations, uh, and around 35 researchers. So we've got a, a good old mix because the challenges we're trying to do require different skill sets. Not one person knows everything that we're trying to do. So that collaboration was essential right from the beginning. Um, we're pushing low TRL things, so that's the Technology Readiness Level, another acronym. So the idea being is that that scale goes from one to nine, one being an, a, a light concept, nine being industrially ready to deploy. And we're pushing that mid-TRL stuff so that the, the, the early ideas can be pushed and tried into harder, more industrially relevant environments so we can get better feedback and then hand over to the supply chain to develop and get it out and earning its keep. What else is there to know? So Ryan has, has had an ambition to support the RAI community, another acronym, uh, tackle increasingly complex challenges. And the way we do that is we've structured RAIN into five working groups. So those working groups are uh, human-robot interaction. I'll summarize these. There's a lot of uh, detail behind them. We're basically dealing with that the kind of pink fleshy interface and then the real hardware that we've got so that the kit we've got can actually be used by real people because it's no good having really advanced kit if you can't use it, right? So that's HRI. We've got verification and autonomy because we recognize that we want to use autonomy. We want to have things running on their own so that a person doesn't need to supervise every single step and everything. But it needs to be trustworthy. You need to be able to understand that what you've asked the equipment to do is what it's going to do. And, you, and if it deviates, then you understand why. That's verification and autonomy. Three more groups. There'll be a test at the end. Standardization. Recognizing that there's lots of different systems, lots of different people, lots of different ambitions, so like sensor use, remote handling equipment, it all needs to be plug and play. It needs to be modular so that it can work quickly when it's out on site or in the field, if you like, standardization. Two more, so remote inspection I mentioned earlier. So remote inspection is predominantly getting data from a distance, putting sensors on robots or, or, or uh, mobile platforms, getting them out so you don't need to expose a human to radiation getting the data back so that then you can make better decisions without having to expose a person to something more dangerous. Get a little bit of information, make a next step decision, and incrementally carry on. Recently, as part of the remote inspection working group, there was a, a demonstration here on site, uh, rear at the um, uh, Column Site UK AEA. Uh, there was a demonstration at the Jets um, Taurus Hall using the remote inspection platform. I'll be brief, you can check the Rain Hub website for details later. But basically, the latest iteration, sort of parallel of this, if you like, of mobile platform, 
a uh, variety of interesting sensors on there, deploying it into an area you don't want people to be in for a long period of time and doing long old scans so that you can get data, both uh, geometry and radiation, overlay the two, see if the environment's behaving as you expect, make decisions, send people in or not and as you go on. But we're here for remote handling. That's our bread and butter for today. Um, there's lots of things we'll cover from today. Um, the event right itself kind of covered some of the flavors that we'll deal with. Um, but I think the main thing is just to get, get a flavor of what we've got um, on board for you today. So remote handling, the context for today is glove boxes. Um, we'll give a bit of a flavor of that in a second. But if the, uh, if the workshop is ready, they're ready to, uh, we've got a thumbs up. We'll uh, hand over to the uh, glove box workshop for a second. We're just going to do a quick tour of the equipment that we've got down there. And we'll come back to them and we'll see how that fits in and we'll get things rolling. Over to you, Brian. Right, I'm going to go mask off so you can all hear me a bit better. So, hello, welcome to the Rain Glove Box Workshop. Um, so, we're down in Cullum, down in the B1 Work Hall. What you can see here is us slowly trying to come back out of lockdown to some degree. So, for the last 18 months, obviously, we've been working in simulation, working very remotely. And so, we made an effort for this demonstration to get back into real robots and into the real nitty gritty of it. On this side, we have the rain glove box, which is a more representative. It's the one that we've had for three years or so. Um, aluminum extrusion box, clear windows, correct sized ports. And in the, on the inside, what you can see is a Canova Gen 3 robot. We went through several generations of different robots before we uh, landed on the Gen 3s. And the basic reason why we've gone for the Gen 3s is down to the, the size diameter of that elbow. So the very thin means you can get in through a standard porthole and then without modifying your glove box, get to what you need to do. Other things you'll notice is that the robot is bagged up in here. This has been for experimentation on what consequences you get from bagging it up. Does the robot overheat? Does it limit motion? But also how you could do it. And also thinking about how you deal with end effectors within that. Other things you'll see in this glove box, cameras. And so those will give us a scene area. And there's also a camera on the end of the robot. On the other side, part of their National Nuclear Users Facility, Pop Robotics. We have this glove box, an Embraer glove box. It's got a posting import on the side. And then with a vacuum chamber, solid glass windows, and two Canova Gen 3s on the inside, two cameras, basically the exact same mirror. We've been using these robots kind of very um, ruggedly in an industrial setting, really pushing to their limits. So if you notice, there is a missing one over here. The replacement only turned up yesterday. It was down to software updates, cramping it. So there would have been more stuff to see, but it also kind of shows that we're not afraid to use these robots in quite an aggressive fashion. So if we move over to roving cam, we'll show what the rest of the room kind of looks like. Oh, oh hello. Yeah, yeah. All right, so it's quite a small area. You can see, come around this side. I don't know. Hey, no, they can hear us up there, so it's actually okay. So we've got control desk one and two. We've got our primary interface devices, the Haptions. They're 60 towels. You'll notice we've got a full range of motion going on these. They can give a high amount of force feedback. So that when you're driving these, you can feel what the robot's doing. Other interfaces devices, we have joysticks when we're doing small, simple motions or very precise motions. We also have the VR handsets as well that uh, Ozan will be showing in a little while. On the screens, you'll also see we've got various different pieces of software going on. So if we switch over to control, uh, control desk one camera, the screen share, we'll see if this happens. Okay, right, this looks good. You see we've got live point cloud data coming in and they're coming from the various different cameras. We've got the cameras coming through. We've got live overlays of tool locations coming into the field. And you can see that's happening in AR or in the VR. And if we swap over to Control Desk 2, we will also see you've got basically the same thing on that one. We also just add the wrist camera in. You can see we can see what's going on with the wrist cameras. So there are a lot of cameras in this room that we'll be swapping in between so that we can actually complete these remote operations but camera views are never quite enough. So some of these cameras have been installed by the robots to some degree um, and given a remotion the focus. But um, you still end up needing to have more VR uh, capability, a digital twin. 
So if we swap over to the VR camera now, what you'll see is Rover remote handling operations for VR. This is our um, in-house race tool that's been built up over sort of 35 years worth of VR operations experience. Lucy, do you want to give a bit more information on this one? Yeah, so this is Rover, which is the remote handling operations virtual reality um, created in-house. It uses an Unreal editor, so that's how we create our uh, 3D models. Um, and then we use a QT and a security to stream the pixel on. Um, this means we can get connections from all kinds of uh, robots. So we have um, the VR for jets over in UK AE. Um, for the blog box today, the promoters are streaming a drop topic. Um, of all the joint positions, which is then streaming in real time to a uh, VR simulation, which you can see on the screen. Um, this is really useful for operators. It's been designed with operators in mind. Uh, they've felt uh, they've given us the requirements. Um, they really like using this tool. It's very simple to use. Um, and it gives us great sort of 3D views of sort of areas you can't quite get with a camera. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. So the other parts of this as well is that on the back end, it has links into RoboDK that can allow you to do CAD CAM style programming for the robot, which then means that if you have a fixed environment like we do here, you know what you're wanting to do. If you want to do a scrubbing task, you can um, program that in beforehand and check that the robot's going to do that. If we jump back to Control Desk 2 for a second, Jeff will be able to talk us through OMS. Hello. So you'll see a screenshot of our operations management system that we use. We can detail out a flow uh, for any operation within the dog box. We will we'll then lay that out uh, on screen as you see, and we can break that down into uh, finer detail. So currently for our demo today, we're gonna roll through the startup procedure of the robots, uh, condition monitoring, radiation survey, some cleaning, uh, and then some glove box uh, operations where we'll, we'll open the pool, import some items, uh, investigate these items, uh, and then clean up and close down afterwards. Excellent. So we'll be following through that sequence today, and also we'll be getting that OMS sequence to be able to fire off the uh, operations for us as well. So when we're doing certain automated tasks, when we get to it within the sequence, OMS will actually fire those off, and that means that we have assurance that things are going to happen. If we quickly move to the roving cam, and take a look at what Ozan's doing, we have a bit of an angle to play with here. So with the VR sticks, if we turn the camera to look at the robots now as well, you can see we're getting live remote operations to be able to perform simple tasks, and we will explain a bit more about the complexities that come with this when we get to the multi-criteria part of our discussion. So we hold there. We want to go back to the studio for a second while we start moving to the next stage. Brilliant. Thank you, Guy. That's a really interesting overview of the technology we've got in there. What do we think in here? Impress? Good? Silence. Stunned into silence. Woo, yeah, okay. So the technology is all very good. We've introduced that. That kind of gives us one kind of level of where things are. Obviously, we've not seen it enormously in action yet. But the, the, the thing that's um, really worth considering is kind of the, the industrial sort of, uh, reference that we're using for all this. So it's easy to look at this sort of stuff and say, okay, we've already got robot arms in there. We can just use this stuff straight away. Um, Okay, fine, the problem solved. And it's, uh, we don't want to give that impression because this is a stepping stone towards the industrially qualified solution. So if we just kind of wind back a quick second into the, the human experience. So the human experience is in parallel to those six inch glove ports, which are at a, a standard um, space in a part, standard size. So if you're a little bit too tall or short for the glove box, because the glove box is primarily for containment, not for humans, although it's now got the gloves in there so people can get in there. It's not designed for human comfort. So you've got that one stumbling block to begin with. The second thing is depending what material you have, you might be handling these things with heavy leaded gloves. So it's gonna be a thick, restrictive, uh, weighty thing on the end of your arm. So you're already operating with your arms at arm's length. Um, so you've got limited um, dexterity and mobility within that space. 
it's cluttered, it's confined, as I say, it's there to keep material in and keep humans out as much as possible. So robotics helps to keep humans out because if we can do that, then it means there's less dose, less risk of injury. So if you're m messing around in things in there, cutting things, sharps get generated, you slice the glove, then that, it's a situation nobody wants. So if we can avoid that by, by uh, supplementing robots into the scenarios, then that makes things much easier. Um, the other consideration, so we've got the um, hazardous materials that are being handled, so there's the human safety and, and just doing things in a better way perspective. Um, but there's also the kind of the challenges of bringing robotics in. So you look at our system and sort of the, the nuclear audience out there will be looking at that saying, well, you wouldn't be able to install those lights in our glove boxes, et cetera. You've got it too easy because you can see straight in, you know, the, the, the glasses are, uh, are clear, they're not opaque. We recognize there are still other challenges to resolve, but this gives us a step towards that. Um, that kind of uh, more advanced demonstration and prove out. One thing I'll just mention before we go back down to the, the workshop, because that's where all the glamour is, is uh, for everyone viewing on YouTube, um, you should be able to add some comments into the chat. If you've got any woohoos, whoops, questions, whatever it is, they'll come through to us. We can share those and, uh, and ask the folks as the demonstration is going on. So if you're uh, ready back in the studio, we've got the scene set, we've got the thumbs up, we'll take you back and we'll uh, see some of the kickoff tasks in, uh, in operation, kind of the setup. All right, so we're about to go into operations, but the first thing we're going to want to do is make sure the robots are in a good state. So Luigi has been working on getting condition monitoring systems working. So if you want to move over to control desk two and share the screen there, and then Luigi, can you talk through what's going to happen? Yeah, so as Guy say, the condition monitoring system is the system that has to assess the conditions of the robot. We do that prior to any operation just to make sure that we will not get stuck during operation. Our techniques using, are using some machine learning techniques, uh, very recent. So basically, we train networks to know where the good behavior is. So whenever there is a non-good behavior, that is an anomaly. And that must be shown to the operator. Now, what we are going to do now is to... Sing, is to uh, induce a fold by wrapping the robot hand into the glove. So basically, if you can please show the robot. So the robot is turning, and basically the glove around it is twisting, and that will eventually catch the motion of the robot and will make everything more difficult. So... So, then if we want to be able to see it on the live screen. Yep. So, on live screen, you should be able to see now the robot. Yeah, yeah, right. So, the robot has got uh, a sphere, uh, amber sphere. That means that uh, an error occurred, occurred. So, if we are going now to do our standard sequence of movements, you can see how from time to time, when the, uh, the motor is stressed more by the glove, you see red spheres. That means that there is a fault. And that is clearly shown to the operator, which does not mean, does not mean many information. It just needs to know if a fault happened, where it happened, or if it happened in the past. Now, without going through the whole sequence, I mean, the, the message is at this point, in this situation, the operator has been stopped editing and assess the situation. So the really clever thing about this is obviously it's flagging up any situations it's not come across before. It's tunable, so if it's not comfortable, if you're, if it's being over cautious, you can tune that in, or if you want to be overly cautious because it's the first time using a robot into an environment, you can be more cautious and flag up more of these errors. Um, but it also works on different robots. So we've applied it to the snake and spotted tensioning issues. And then if we take a look at the tarn with the roving camera, yeah, it's a big yellow thing. We'll see we've got people. Sohei has been working on using that robot for condition monitoring. So I don't know if Sohei wants to show what he's got now. Yeah. Where? <laughs> Switch 
you want to switch bikes to the roving camp? The performance of the systems. Um, okay, we Sorry. want to get to a stage where we can buy the, buy the system before they uh, even get to the development stage. We want to, to de-risk and, and kind of uh, uh, speed up the process of handling uh, equipment. So we can take components within this TARM system, each actuator, the boxes, boxes, any of the components that make up the system, characterize them, utilize them using uh, various software. In this case, Dyn's one of the one of the systems we're using. Um, and the idea is that if we can get to a stage where we have a database of information about each actuator, each gearbox, we can get to a stage where we develop a system and test it without having to uh, create a kind of costly gear, uh, glove box or, or real life system. The nature of, of uh, fusion power plants or remote handling technologies, they are, they are quite expensive to develop to a, stage, to a stage where we can do all of that testing and all of that modification within a simulation environment. Uh, that will help us lower that cost. Um, it also makes it a lot safer as well. Um, and finally, to be able to uh, characterize, the, characterize the components, we can then develop new systems without uh, re uh, rely on new components. Um, that's, uh, that's the time that I'm going to be working on. So this, this is kind of what the most complicated system we have here. Uh, seven joints in total, not including any of the structure at the top. And, and, um, and it can uh, have an end effector at the end. In this case, uh, we'll be uh, using a uh, manipulator like Mascot, if you've not saw before. Um, it is a uh, command armed uh, manipulator. Um, and the idea is that we can split each of these individual joints up and characterize those. Um, and then we can characterize them itself and itself. Um, finally, end up with a simulation where we can then test moves that we have within that software and then validate those moves on um, the real system. Um, getting to a stage where we can have the two matching each other. Uh, the, end result, the end result being more robust and representative simulations of real systems. Uh, hand, it back over, hand it back over to uh, and uh, carry on. Perfect, so that's a good overview of some of the simulation technologies that we have. So the condition monitoring there, so it shows the condition of the robot as it's performing operations. You like that one? Nice nice reference, obvious acronym. Uh, sometimes you can explain things too much. Um, and then the, the diamond sort of modeling so that we've got different um, scales of robot that we're dealing with. One of the things I hadn't mentioned yet was the fact that Rain obviously has its sort of own um, challenge zones, if you like, and themes that we focus on ourselves, but we weave into a lot of different projects and programs so that we can either just share expertise kind of across the fence, if you like, where appropriate, or we just get proper hands-on links in to... Um, to uh, other things that can be tried and tested. So a lot of the technology that we're sharing today in the demonstration, the things that have been developed elsewhere and then amalgamated and incorporated into our demonstration because then it gives another proof that it works in another environment. So RANS as sort of a test bed for others has got value in itself. So um, we've spoken about real on-site activities and setting up things like radiation surveys and, and stuff like that which, because you'd want to start um, your working day uh, in the glove box environment in a, in a, a predicted, characterized way. Um, so maybe if we go back to the workshop, they might just be ready to uh, give us a, a run through of what uh, radiation surveys might involve. All right, so we're back in the, back in the glove box room. Um, in the meantime, all the robots are up in the location. We're ready to go. So obviously we're kind of a, imagining uh, simulating what we'd be doing in an operation. One of the things you might be doing is using a tool first, a scanning tool to check your location. And so on the roving camera, what you can see down bottom right, maybe, up, we've got a radiation sensor. So if we lift it up so you can see it a bit better, maybe. Now, one of the things to note on these robots is that they have a kilogram payload. We've got 800 grams worth of end effector on the end. And I think this box probably weighs about two and a half. Now that means we are going over the operational limits, but one of the reasons why we have this condition monitoring system is because we're constantly monitoring the thermal outputs of the motors. So we can actually exceed for short periods of time and compared to the operation we're gonna do quite long periods of time, um, the operational limits and be able to carry these quite heavy operations. The other benefit of having robots is obviously being able to do automated routines. So if you were say scanning the surface of a glove box, 
with a radiation scanner, what you could do is just slowly drive back and forth. Oh, and hit the other robot if you're not paying attention. This allows you to repeatedly overlay against your VR, your operation, to see what you're doing. Now this is quite awkward, quite slow, only works if you know your environment, you can pre-plan this in RoboGK in the VR first, that has its value. However, we move over to what Erwin's doing, we can see um, what we would plan to do next. Erwin, do you want to describe your part? Yes. So, Erwin, do you want to swing over to Erwin? Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Erwin. I'm a PDRA at the University of Manchester, and this is one of the first works that we're trying to put together between the HRI group, where I belong, and the uh, manipulation group. But we're trying to create an assisted radiation survey task uh, using some of the technology and ideas that we created when we played around uh, the HRI thing, where we want to create really safe and efficient interfaces where the human is really assisted and can do any task very easily. And what we have here we have basically um, a digital twin, similar to what uh, our colleague showed in the morning. It's connected to the real robot that you see over there in the glove box. So you can see that. Uh, and here in our uh, twin interface, what I'm going to use is this device that allows me to interact seamlessly with the environment. So you can see my hands here. And what I can do is I can restrict and modify and basically do a semi-autonomy-like uh, behavior mm -hmm imposed on the robot whilst I move it. So what I what I need to do is I only touch the this marker, let's call it, and I move it, and the robot that you see there, we move where I need to need it to move. And if you see in the robot uh, in the glove box area, uh, I'm moving the robot as I'm moving it just with my hand. Right? So with this thing, uh, what it can, we can easily do is we can set uh, different distances and different axes. Uh, so it's easy to do any uh, radiation survey or scanning. So right now we are doing it just per axis. So basically I'm just setting a fixed axis uh, motion, but I can do it with the other axis. And I can, and, I, and we can do it with any, um, with any shape or plane that we want to modify or, or motion. Uh, we're planning to do this also with velocity control, not only position control, but we both make the motion safe, that we don't crash the, the robot against himself, against uh, the glove box, but also that it's easy, so you can only use your hands, uh, you don't, uh, the interface doesn't wear out, uh, you can just use it. It can be also um, geometrically and uh, secure. This is all VR technology, so you could use uh, a VR headset, but here it's fine, you cannot use that anymore, because uh, we know that uh, a lot of um, induced motion sickness happens when we use uh, VR at the moment. So we can just do it any angle. And we're planning to do this uh, for radiation survey uh, with the sensor that um, Guy showed. We can do it with any rotation, or with any motion. Hopefully in the next uh, demo, we can show how it doesn't crash against the walls, how we can basically do a uh, radiation survey quite easily, only with hand motions. Uh, yes, basically those are some other ideas. And this is based on Manchester work that will show Later on, where we do teleoperation, remote teleoperation, also with VR. Thank you, guys. Back Great. to you all. All right, let's move into some operations. So, thank you, Owen. That's really cool. And yeah. obviously, the hand, uh, the human robot interaction being led by Guido Herman has got some really exciting stuff coming up, coming forwards using this equipment, making it more intuitive to use. So, if we want to move over to Control Desk One, share screen and maybe share the roving cam at the same time, or something along those lines, let's open up a port. So we've got the Hatcham device, benefit of the robots, these have got infinite degrees of rotation around some of these joints. Jeff is going to have to tell me which way is open and which way is closed when I'm closed. Yeah, to get correct. So when we get to a, unlocking a, a porthole, it's incredibly easy. We can flick open the door, constantly just move in, get to what we need and get to the situation. Just rotate. So one of the things you'll notice for all of this is that we have these mascot ripple blocks. So again at race we have 40,000 hours worth of operational experience 
Um, and through this period, we have worked out through probably a lot of failures, a lot of redesigns, a lot of prototypes, what we want to be doing when it comes to designing things that are easy for robots to hold. Um, and so that's primarily through the equipment box, but there are thousands of different tooling designs that then enable us to be able to complete these operations. So, next thing we're going to want to do, now we've got the blocks out, think about getting a snake ready to inspect, but we're going to inspect the outside first. So, Jeff, if you want to be able to come and grip this can, I might want to move it a little bit closer. Yeah. You want to just take control of the other robot? We'll get to operating. So, little robot operations going on, multiple people. So you'll notice Robo's elbows getting in the way of each other. It's a limited space environment. Collisions are going to happen. You can control this, and we'll talk about how we control that. Or you can just tell the elbows to get out of the way. So I'm going to bring this closer for Jeff to be able to reach it easily. Just bring it over to you, Jeff. Piece of equipment is from i3D. They have a glove box ready camera. So, if Radico, you want to come through and start getting that operating. So, this is a rad hard camera. I'll try not to shine the laser into anyone's eyes. The laser is quite useful for knowing where you're aiming the thing. So, we could use the camera of the robots, but this is going to give us a much better view. If we swap to our NAS cam as well. Our NAF cam, the other one. Just wait for the. Right, well, we'll just have to. Is your camera not on? You're not sharing screen, right? Okay. Just while you um, set up the um, screen share, we've not got it on our side. We've got a couple of questions. I'll just do the second one first, just because it fits in. Got one about VR controls. But this one says So when you're using your hands to control the robot, how do you stop it from copying you when your arm gets tired or you're finished with your task? So, yeah, that's quite an interesting one. Nice thing about, obviously, robots is that if you, if you um, either let go of the control device, so the Hatchens, they have a laser enable or they have buttons for you to click for you to disable it, then you can reset your arms in different locations, get comfortable again, and carry on, or you can actually get the robot to start doing things automatically. So if you want to start rotating. Brilliant. Yeah. So you've got a hand-based hand control to allow you to um, control when you're controlling the robot. Thanks, Joy. Thanks for the question, Melanie. Yeah, just a small comment. We can also, as we start designing these uh, interfaces, and we know that uh, traditional interfaces have a connector or a double switch that you need to enable so you can move uh, basically the robot. We are trying to think about how to do that also in the VR, meaning that in VR, everything is very interactive, and you can easily move things around and crash them. But if we just interface these ideas from um, previous controllers where you basically need to step on something or click something and have a lever that activates the motion of the robot, we can do that easily. So the, the person needs to be aware that they're doing motion and enable it with besides just uh, the hand motion. So it will be like double double security or double safety. If that don't yeah, that all makes sense. There are a, a couple of questions on the VR, which I'll come back to in a second. So on here, we can see the, um, the, the right hand from the robot's perspective having rotated the container and then the i3D camera, having scanned that. So um, what's the value there, Guy? So we built up a beautiful map of the outside of the robot. Next thing we need to worry about the inside of the robot. So I'm going to quickly grab the can from this end and we'll start inserting the robot snake from the University of Nottingham. 
So Pateo, you want to get yourself into place. Uh, Radhika, if you want to, uh, yeah, move your laptop. Well done. Thank you, Radhika. So for viewers online, if you um, look to the, the top right of the glove box, if you like, in that, that top corner, um, or ju just in from the corner, and you'll, you'll notice the like entering through the top. You just see creeping above that yellow toggle on the, uh, on the container. It's making its way down to inspect the uh, cannons in the arm of the robot, when the um, hand of the robot. So this is the, uh, the snake, Matteo. Matteo's joined us from uh, Nottingham. So what Matteo is doing at the moment is remote controlling the robot snake to be able to get into tight locations. So maybe we'll show a video later of us feeding it through the external pipe work, feeding it in through the pipe work and then weaving it with the robots back into another pipe to inspect into all the nooks and crannies that you need to. So if you had, say, uh, an oven, some sort of processing equipment inside the um, inside the glove box that you needed to be able to inspect with inside of, check for liquors. This sort of robot would be able to go and do that. Cobra is another project this has been working on, um, and that's been for on-wing inspection inside uh, jet engines to be able to cut the um, cut and clean inspect for any chips within the rotor blades. And so at the moment, you can see there's a high degree of freedom at the end of that robot that enables it to be able to weave through complicated pipe work, choose your route. You've got fiber optics leading down to the end so you can take camera lighting down to the end and be able to control what you need to. Yeah? So if we want to just collaborate between the two. The other nice thing that we can do it's because this works as a more complicated stethoscope to some degree, or an endoscope, the robots can actually grab and manipulate these robots to be able to get even more control out of them. Another thing to notice while we're doing this is that we can see the, um, the robots, the Canovas, can reach a vast array of areas. So about, we can about reach 95% of the workspace with each robot, and then between the two we can cover about 100%. Um, and that's because they're slightly longer than human arms, and they've got more dexterity. Um, the port opening task looked very easy when doing it with the robot. I have to say, doing it manually through gloves was incredibly difficult. incredibly challenging. There we go. So we've got a nice inspection of the inside now. Maybe to work that out. So if we then work backwards. Brilliant. So if we now start thinking about cooling design. So one of the other things just to look at while we're doing this. Again, we're in very cramped environments. So Using up space is always going to be a premium. That's going to be very true when it comes to using the tool station. So we move to control desk one for a second. What you're seeing on this is Josh's here. You can quickly just have a quick description of what's going on. Do you want to move the... Um... So we've seen, try to pick up some of the tools with the mascot grips that have been spoken about. It requires quite a level of uh, dexterity, it needs good accuracy, good repeatability. So this is something we really wanted to work on automated. Um, so doing this, we want to be able to pick up a tool anywhere in the glove box. The operator doesn't need to know where the tool is, they just want to select, say, a brush, a Dremel, a scanner. Using AR tags, we've managed to localize these tools using the cameras in the top corners. So whilst during operation for, well, say, the radiation survey, They'll select the tool and through autonomous uh, selection, which I don't know which screen's being shared at the minute, you'll see the video happening. It autonomously picked the position. We then got cooperation between the two robots. We moved the tool frame to make it more difficult for the robot on its return to the tool. And you'll see once it starts moving again, it copes with both the translation of the tool frame and the change in rotation. 
and you'll see at the minute it's doing this, it goes to its new position and does its subroutine to put back at all and pick it back up again. And this works well for in the single glove box, but when you consider linking multiple glove boxes together with, say, a, tool, a rail between them all, you can really see how autonomous this would be and how much more efficient. You can have one tool frame between, say, six glove boxes. You don't need as many tools. You don't need as uh, you, know, you don't need as much space taken up in a cluttered environment, um, and you don't even need to put a tool frame down in the glove box itself. It can be suspended above the ground. Do your tool change and then remove it from the glove box. Um, yeah, so reducing the clutter um, and increasing the efficiency of the whole of the whole situation. Thanks, Josh. That's really good. While we're talking on the uh, the topic of VR, um, we'll go through the uh, the questions related to the subject. So we've got this one in from uh, Milkage. Thanks for the question. So we've got maybe I missed it, but with the VR controls, is there a plan to use a VR headset and have a mounted camera in the box? This way, you have a first person view. Might be more natural for the operator. Um, yes, definitely. So we've experimented that before, and you'll actually see that later in the demo that going on for remote operations from here on our site driving a robot in Manchester. Um, there's a, a game to be playing on that one when we're thinking about um, wearing a headset for a long period of time. If you're going to be doing glove box operations, you may be having to wear the headset for a very long period. So, Jeff, um, if we want to... And we've got, we got one more question in the, on the, time or the, uh, the VR theme. So, Milky Edge again, good questions. So, we got VR can have a tendency to miss movements due to external factors. How do you plan to stop errors occurring? Are there parameters in place to stop input from sporadic changes to the movement? Um, so, there's a few things going on there. So, obviously, we're taking dead reckoning, we're taking the, the point clouds, we're doing quite a bit of filtering on those. We've also got systems like what Radica has developed. So, if we just quickly jump to. Uh, take a look. So we're playing as a video, but it's all running in the background at the moment. But what we're seeing here, Radhika, do you want to quickly describe? So uh, here we are doing, uh, so here we are doing um, scene segmentation. So we're basically uh, classifying each pixel of the image uh, belonging to a certain category. And we're using a, a deep learning uh, based model called Deep Lab V3. And we use like, hundreds of images from the glove box and similar images to annotate them and train the models. And uh, this is to give a more detailed uh, description of the environment and segment out the robots from the planes and the other obstacles. Uh, Excellent. So beyond that as well, using machine learning to pull out information from the scene. So as you can see, we're using a variety of different information to be able to feed into the robot scene at any one moment, keeping as live and updated as possible. Now, with all this information, it's going to become difficult to feed that to a human without it just being too much information, a, a, a burden to them, or just actually annoying because it's getting in the way of the operation. So we've got a PhD down in uh, Bristol Robotics Lab working on thinking about AR in a situation that are complicated. Um, so we're now moving into a situation where we've opened up the tin. We're going to tip it out, and then we'll start moving from there. All right. Again, see if we can get everything out. Just get everything out of there. Put this out of the way, ready for packing again later. So just to note what we're simulating here um, with this tin can with internals would be something of the nature of this. So I'm just going to move over to the roving can for a second. We've got, take off the labels, out tin cans. These would be welded shut, so it need to be ground open. On the inside, we we'll then have an internal can. Internal can then requires opening inside the can. There would be a plastic bag. It would be degraded over time. And we're thinking about the internals, replacing them, rating them, perhaps sorting, segregating them, ready to go forward. Um, right. So what we can see here, inside the glove box, we're just going to do a little bit of sorting and segregating first before Jeff starts getting the tools out, eager. Um, you could manually do this. It's going to be a slow 
painful task, especially you may know what your um, different components are. You may have done your ILW scan, your LLW scan, sorted them out. You're starting to segregate them, so you know you're separating out your batteries from your from your recyclable metal waste, and you can quickly move them around, pile them up for what you need to do. Um, however, there is no reason why a robot shouldn't be doing this. This is entirely the type of thing a robot should be able to be doing. So if Radica, again, sorry Radica, you're double up in the script. We show some videos quickly. We did have running in the glove box, but we're running a little bit out of schedule here. We'll just play some videos. Uh, yeah, so Radica, do you want to describe what your system is doing? So here we are um, busting uh, objects using deep learning models. So this is for uh, objects that are much smaller and more difficult to grasp. So it uses, so in this case, it uses a variational autoencoder. So it scans the scene, and the neural network gives a 2D map of the possible uh, grasps, and it uses that information to find uh, the correct position to grasp the small objects. And it picks it up and puts it in a small basket. Um, so yeah, that's. Uh, suitable for um, objects that are more difficult to grasp, um, like sharp objects and uh, those that have shapes that are uh, more complicated. Okay. Um, I think it, it's hard to quantify the complexity that's going on here as well. So these objects have never been seen by the algorithm before. Ah, yes. They're designed to be as complicated to grasp for the robot as possible, so they've been uh, grown through uh, uh, genetic algorithms to be as complicated to grasp as possible, and Radica is getting ninety. Uh, yeah, it's ninety-five to ninety-eight. Ninety-five to ninety-eight percent quality of grasps um, of those. So, if you're doing a sort of segregate on objects you've never seen before, Radica's system is doing an amazing job of being able to pick these up. So, we've got a question in there, Guy. From uh, sorry to interrupt, um, Radica and Guy. So, a question in from Ethan, and I think what you've just described kind of um, addresses that neatly. So it was saying about what are your plans for grasping objects not adapted for this gripper or performing in-hand manipulation? So if there's anything else you want to furnish around that, then um, that's a good time. Yeah, so these objects are very much not made for gripping, but obviously not. We can manage anything that would be a pinch grip style. However, uh, if you're not in a pinch grip, we've got other grippers that we can think about. So if we move over to the roving cam for a second, and we'll probably come back to this in a minute as well at the end, we've got different styles of grippers. So this was going to be on the robot that was broken. This is a QB soft hand. It's similar to a shadow robot hand of having five fingers and five grips. Main difference is it's a one degree of freedom. So it's got a differential gearbox. So when one finger limits out, see if I can work out how to show you this, um, you can get the others to respond. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, just about. Yeah, we can see that. Um, and so the nice thing about this, you can go around it and you can pick up very delicate things to pick up from the ground. Um, and it's actually quite impressive. It can pick up flat pieces of metal off flat surfaces. Um, on a similar end from a Hatchin device, if we want to be able to pick up complicated objects from the Hatchin device. You want to just look at the flat piece of plastic there. We can actually do fairly complicated little tasks. So if we look at trying to pick up this flat little tile thing, um, we can kind of do it first time. And this is born between the level of haptics that we're getting out of the device, and also just the nature of um, the object. So we can show we can do that again fairly reliably. I'll just flop it on the floor somewhere. Um, we can do. I can about do it with scissors and plasters. I. It's worth noting that I've had about six hours of practice with this device, so it doesn't take that long to get to a quite a comfortable place. Now I'm not saying this is easy, but it's not as difficult as you would imagine. All right, do we want to jump back to the studio for a second? Maybe. Thank you, guys. Fascinating insight into, uh, into the, some of the progress so far with um, object uh, manipulation, grasping, things like that. So we, one of the things that I'm working around is, is you kind of take a lot for granted as a, as a pink, fleshy human. Just if you just want to pick something up, you just kind of automatically just grasp and, and you know where to pick something up. If it slips, you know how to adjust things. Obviously, the robots, they don't know that, so they, they need to be told how to interact with the objects. The, um, the ability to quickly assess a scene and then be able to interact with objects as a kind of a human would, 
is uh, an enormous advantage so that machine learning technology is something that helps cut the uh, time between the task needing to be done and then things actually need uh, being undertaken. Um, so as a quick recap, and we'll get a flavour in the room of how impressed people are, because everyone is, uh, is still awake, which is very good, I'm very pleased. Um, would have expected nothing else. So we've seen condition monitoring so far. So you start up the robots, make sure everything's doing okay. I, I didn't expect to do my own moves, but there you go. So condition of the robots, um, the, the kind of parallels to larger manipulators and, and the um, research references that can, that can help. Um, kicking off radiation surveys, so making sure your environment is characterized or understood. So you know what's in there, you know where any materials are so that you can make the next decision where you just carry on and work or do something else. Um, delete motion control, so being able to interact with just your hands in free space, so being able to manipulate in an unencumbered kind of way rather than using the Haption devices or the Vive controls which are all hands-on, moving things around methods. Um, we've seen the packaging in construction so far, so we have a mock container um, coming into the, the zone, so the robot arm interacting with that port on the side, being able to open it up that's swinging open, bringing the container in, doing that first pass inspection so that you can, again, work out what you want to do next with that container. Um, removing the lid from that container, emptying the contents out. Uh, and then, well, at the moment, we've just made a mess in the glove box, okay? So that's our, our next thing to, to deal with. Um, and we've got the uh, I3D inspection, so looking particularly for sharp. So obviously, in an ideal world, your container comes out. It's in a nice, predictable uh, expected state condition, but it might not be. So being able to identify if it's kind of um, uh, malformed or there are any sharps on there, then you can make, again, decisions on how to interact with that container. Um, we've looked into the, auto, the potential for the automated tool changes, so having references in the glove box. So the operator, again, doesn't have to kind of search for the tools in there, you do a bit of uh, background setup, and then the robot can interact with tools for you and save a bit of search and locate time, which is all helpful. Um, we've gone into the machine learning, deep learning, things like that to give an overview there. And then some of the grasping algorithms that we've got. Um, we take this moment to, um, to just throw through a few of the questions that we've not had so far. I'm just looking to them on screen. So we've uh, gone through a good portion. We've got Medi, which we'll get on screen. Um, so as a question into the workshop. So Medi's said, uh, I'll notice you're using ROS at the moment. We'll cover other things about that a bit later. So we're using ROS, do you experience any latency with video stream and arms control? So with the video, inside of a room where you've got direct connections with good ethernet, no, from the robots, definitely not. So the amount of data flowing through. However, when you're starting to re work remotely and you'll see in a little while with the point clouds and videos, yes. But Salvador, working on a public, uh, project with uh, Republic of Korea, and University of Manchester, they've been able to deal with that streaming issue very, very well. So we'll come to that again in a little while. I, I think we've got then about three stops, haven't we? Yeah, that's right. So we'll, we'll pause that question and, and answer for and move on to a second uh, or, or third, I guess, VR question. Um, so we've got, yeah, if you just pop that one up. So we've got fantastic work on uh, VR. How many tools are able to be picked up by the image analysis and is it capable of noticing very intricate details? I like the cast, by the way. That's so, yeah, so um, basically it's down to the camera. So there's a, we've got, again, working with i3D on a smart grasping project, we're able to pick out the gripper blocks. So if you want to bring the camera around, the yellow blocks that we're seeing in here are the gold blocks, the sort of standard locations. For grasping, we're able to pick those out. Um, and then down to how small can we see, it's very much down to the high definition, if that's a word, the, the quality of the camera, and then it's just down to focusing in and putting that out. The limit up from the YOLO is actually very small for being able to do the segmentation. The objects are sort of penny washers, smaller that you're picking out. And if you want it better, you just bring the camera closer. So at the moment, we're sort of sitting up in these corners. But with the i3D camera, you unmount it from the corner and you just drag it into location and look at where you need to. All right, do we want to talk about multi-criteria quickly? Thank you, guys. Actually, I'll just ask a quick question because it kind of leads into that. Uh, thank you, Piat, for that one. Uh, it's always good as well to learn new terms. So high definitionness is going into my terminology dictionary. Uh, so question from Kitty. So cats really have taken over the internet. Uh, question from Kitty Cat. What control is there over the position of the elbow and other links of the arm when moving the gripper? And I think we're just going to yeah, answer that question. Really 
And it's a really, it's a really important one actually. So if we take a look with the Rogan camera, what you'll see is we have a six degree of freedom motion here, set up for the gripper, but it's asymmetric against the robot, and the robot is seven degrees of freedom. So one of the things that we notice a lot is when you're controlling this, and you'll have seen it happening as well, the elbows are always kind of going to the worst location possible. When one of the joints locks out, goes towards an singularity, it will stop moving comfortably, and then the next one in the chain will get worse, and it slowly collapses into a situation where you're no longer able to move that robot in the intuitive fashion. You have to sort of unwind it painfully. So this is where Ozan's work's been coming in. So Ozan, do you want to be describing what the system is? So one of the things we develop at RACE is an inverse schematics method for redundant manipulators, and this algorithm has been implemented uh, for the Kinova robot working in the glove box. As Guy said, uh, especially when you're doing a teleoperation, it's very easy to uh, caught up in a singular or in a singular position or reach the joint limit where it's hard, slightly harder to recover. So our inverse kinematics uh, algorithm is not just trying to solve the inverse kinematics, but it's trying to enhance it by considering uh, additional criteria. The, the, the good thing about our approach is that we can introduce arbitrary amount of uh, criteria into our solutions. Here we are interested in basically two. Uh, one of them is for avoiding the singularities, which we call the manipulability of the robot, and the other one is avoiding the joint limits. So we're finding inverse kinematic solutions which are less likely to be a singular configuration for the robot, in addition to being uh, fairly away from the uh, uh, joint limits. And that has been running right now on the robot. So yeah, what we're seeing here, motion is going to be slightly different than what we saw in the other ones. All the joints are moving to compensate each other so we stay in location. If you then get stuck in a location you don't want, you can just move that elbow while keeping that tip directly in location. And it's not necessarily just moving that elbow, it's moving the rest of the robot just so that tip stays in location. And we have that on both of the robots. Let me try and just jump to the other one quickly. So hopefully, there you go get the elbow to move out of the way. And so part of the system is either you can move it manually, but the clever bit that comes from Ozan's work is trying to do that so the robot's doing that intuitively, matching what a human would be expecting. I don't know if this is true or not. It's something probably for HRI psychologists think about. I think most of us have in our heads an expectation of where we would want that elbow to go, and it's just not playing ball. Um, so what Ozan is trying to get that robot is to act more intuitively. We'll also talk a bit more about how you can extend this towards collision avoidance as we go forwards. Um, but that is kind of a, a different issue. So I think we're then jumping up to upstairs where we're going to see a remote demo of robots driving in Manchester. So maybe back to the studio until they're ready. Perfect. Thank you, Guy. So we've got some really good questions coming in. Um, if there are any more as we go through, please do add them into the chat. Um, we'll, is there any questions uh, from the floor while we've just got a second? One question. Um, if I use my two arms and doing something, if I push against uh, this, this one moves over, what do the two robots do if they kind of hit each other? They okay, so the, they did, did you hear that question down in the um, workshop, guys? Yeah. Um, so... What they do is not that much, really. They the one that you're hitting resists to stay in motion. If you over torque, the robots will stop because they will limit the force and stop damage to each other. However, there has been situations where it's been useful to lean one against the other, and that gives you more stability in the same way as if you were writing something, you might use yourself to rest. And we're also seeing that with resting the elbow against the floor to be able to do more dexterous slash stiffer tasks. And we'll show you that later as well. Um, so robots touching, interacting with the world, we're trying to avoid them touching each other. It's not the end of the world, really. These robots are there to be used, get jobs done, and limit human hands going into these glove boxes. Brilliant. Thank you, Guy. I've got a of approval on this side. That's good. Thank you for the question. Uh, one more. box. So it's related to maybe the future in the long ops and things. Do you plan to add things you put into the glove box to your VR model. And therefore, for example, your, your seven-arm seven, um, manipulator would take a different path 
Mm -hmm. Did you hear that question? No. Can you repeat that one? I didn't. So uh, basically, the the glove box does have touchscreen there at the moment, but are we planning to add more features in them, or maybe equipment, so that the robots need to take different paths, so that we don't get too comfortable just having it mid clutter? Yeah, and then add the clutter to the VR as well. Yeah, very much so. So the stuff that we're putting out of Radka's um, information can be fed back into the VR. We'll see that a little bit going on with progress stuff and being able to take stuff from the real world and put it into simulation so we can practice in simulation. And so we've been doing that with CANs before doing grasping and the same with what Radka you were seeing, the automated grasping, import objects that we've seen in the real world into the simulation, practice, and then bring back to the real world in a very streamlined fashion. It's also bringing in the point clouds. So we actually had a project hmm, two years ago using Rover uh, called Synthetic Viewing with ETA. And that was about bringing in uh, real world data into this VR to sort of augment it to give you more and more data. Um, there's a balance to be made there. And this is where we try and lean on people like Jeff, our remote handling expert who has experience within glove boxes to say this information's too much. It's actually getting in the way of the useful information versus going forward. So there's a balance to be made there. Brilliant. All Thank right. you, Guy. Answer question sufficiently? Perfect. Thank you. Right. So, um, yeah, we're going to go over to control room two, I believe. We're not just in a couple of locations. We'll dial into Erwin. Hi there, Erwin. Hello. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Hi. Me again. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about the work I've been doing in Manchester about remote or long distance teleoperation, uh, where we're basically using, as everyone knows, this type of uh, VR headset. This is the HTC Vive Pro. Right now, we're experimenting with more advanced ones as the, well, newer ones as the Quest 2 and the larger one. But ideally, it's similar to what I showed, have a similar type of sensors where we grab, uh, see um, hand motions. We have all the VR representations of the world uh, in the VR headset, and we easily move the robot around. Uh, we're going to show you a video of an experience we had uh, between uh, Edinburgh and Manchester. Uh, unfortunately, we're still facing a problem where, although it works very well, I and mean, you can see a video feed from uh, the remote place, uh, because of the streaming that we're having here, uh, the internet is not that uh, stable, hence it could be dangerous, so we don't want to break our robots in Manchester. So I think we'll show you a video of that. And also my colleague from Manchester, uh, Hanley New, will explain some of the work that we're trying to do for obstacle avoidance, where we not only manipulate the robot and we do grasp uh, objects, but we also avoid uh, real world uh, objects, where, uh, as Guy said, we do this mapping between real world and virtual world, which is actually one of the most crucial and difficult things to do, not on, is not only putting the object and moving it around, as some people said in the VR, there are a lot of problems with sensing uh, the actuation and just the interface between these two worlds, the virtual world and the real world. And we're trying to deal with these problems uh, all together. Uh, so, over to you, Holly, so if you're there to share your screen and talk a bit about the obstacle. Thank you. OK, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, everyone? Yes, yes we can hear you online and clear. Right. OK, OK, OK. Uh, so, so uh, firstly, I will uh, introduce our setup, and um, uh, we did a demo with University of Edinburgh before. And uh, in in this map, you can see that uh, we put the master PC um, with the uh, VR headset and also leap motion in uh, Edinburgh, which we call the it's the master PC. And uh, we also put the uh, slave PC, which was connected to the real ro robot in Manchester. And uh, the master PC and slave PC, they connect to the Amazon AWS server based in uh, London. And uh, we were using Ethereum uh, Wi-Fi. Actually, we also tested using 4G net network. Um, so, so you can you can choose uh, where where is um, uh, internet or uh, Ethernet or 4G uh, based on your uh, demand. And then. Uh, we tested to, um, uh, and in this video, uh, we uh, asked the researcher in Edinburgh, he, he teleoperated our robotic arm uh, based in uh, Manchester, and he was using 
um, uh, HTC Vive uh, VR headset and also Leap Motion to read the head, head hand uh, gesture so he can control the virtual uh, marker, uh, which is on the, on the effect of the virtual robotic arm uh, based in Edinburgh. And actually, this virtual um, robotic arm, it was um, synchronized with the real robotic arm um, using the AWS, uh, uh, AWS server. And uh, then I will uh, show you the video. Uh, Okay, uh, so so this uh, the researcher in Edinburgh uh, University, and he um, he uh, teleoperated the robotic arm in a virtual world. So he controlled the orientation and the position of this virtual marker attached to this end effect. Then then we use the inverse kinematics algorithms to translate this uh, position of this uh, virtual marker into the joint angle command of the real robotic arm. So then. Then this command it was sent to this real robotic arm, so uh, it was uh, synchronized. So so he just grasped this um, bottle uh, and um, and move randomly. Um, yeah. So so you can still see that we we have some uh, delays delays of this uh, um, uh, uh, control command, um, uh, but uh, he. He can uh, actually uh, pick, pick up something uh, success, successfully, and and you can also see that in this virtual world, we are using two two uh, D webcam to to give the operator the scene of the real world. So we we put one web camera on on the left, and then we we put another web camera on the top. So so he can see what what what's happening in this virtual world. Uh, actually, recently we developed some three uh, D. Uh, uh, seeing rendering uh, technology using uh, point cloud uh, compression and uh, decompression because uh, we tested that using AWS server with its limited bandwidth. Uh, actually, it's quite challenging to to transmit some three D point cloud uh, because it will cause some delay. And and later the researcher in in race uh, Salvador he will introduce how he implement uh, the three uh, D point cloud compression. And the decompression, so we can do uh, the real time 3D scene uh, transmission. Uh, and uh, before Salvador's part, I'm going to uh, show another another technology we developed, which is uh, the collision avoidance algorithms. So, so in in this video, you can see that the uh, the operator he uh, teleoperated this virtual marker, and then this robotic arm can it can follow this virtual marker. However, when the operator sometimes he might do some mistake, and then this virtual marker it is inside of one collision risk, and in this case, our collision-free inverse kinematics algorithms will do a, a collision-free path to avoid this obstacle. So, so you can see that the operator can do anything he wants, and and with uh, and don't need to care much about the collision risk. But the collision free inverse kinematics algorithms, it, it will handle the safety. Uh, so it will generate the collision free uh, trajectory, and then the robotic arm will, uh, will always be, uh, be safe. Um, so, so we uh, recognize, uh, we use our camera to recognize this, um, this box, and then we, we localize its post, and then we, we put a virtual marker, we put a virtual marker in, in the, the RVs. Um, then we uh, we use collision-free uh, algorithms to calculate e uh, the position between this virtual marker and each joint. So we wanted to uh, uh, to make our robotic arm to reach this virtual marker and still maximize the distance between each joint and also uh, and also the, the virtual marker to to keep it away from the uh, uh, to keep it away from the collision risk, but still reach. The, the virtual marker, which was teleoperated by the uh, operator. Um, okay, that's my part. Um, uh, should we uh, change it to Salvador's part to explain the point cloud compression? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. So here's Salvador. He will talk about uh, the, the point cloud transmission part. It's for you, Salvador. And here's your screen. Yes. Tell us when it's ready. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Yeah, my name is Salvador. I'm working in, in Grace as well, and I'm collaborating with Rain in the in the synthetic viewing aspects of the teleoperation. So, as my colleagues were talking before, uh, it is very important for for the operator in the so-called local side to understand what is happening live in the remote side or where the robot, the actual physical robot, is located. So, for that, uh, sometimes, especially in the collision avoidance techniques, it might not be enough to transmit video or our images of what's happening. So, but also it's important to transmit 3D information, 3D data. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, we have plenty of sensors nowadays that are very easy to integrate for, uh, for these purposes. Uh, unfortunately, the type of data and the size of the data can be very large. So transmitting this information, particularly in scenarios like the ones discussed in this particular uh, setup where the local and the remote are very, very far away geographically. Uh, we need to find ways to grab this information in the remote side, compress it, transmit it over the network as fast as we can, and decompress it in the local side for user visualization. So in this video that you're showing, that you are showing on the screen, uh, we are remotely controlling the robot using the markers that you can see on the screen. But not only that, uh, we are extending or augmenting the information visualized on the local side with the point cloud data on the remote side. To do that, we are basically uh, codifying the information using tree-like structures, um, tree-like structures for uh, serialization of the information, which is uh, uh, the approach we're following. Uh, more than that, it is also important to adjust according to the bandwidth or the needs of the operator. So it is important for us to, to be able to configure the transmission and the compression at different rates or different resolutions, uh, prioritizing always uh, that the operator is visualizing what is happening. So we can adjust our compression, our resolution based on that. Further than, uh, more than that, we are also investigating techniques uh, that not just transmit everything that is happening on the scene, but also focusing on specific aspects of the scenario that are more important for visualization. For example, the motion of the robot or some saliency aspects of the scene that may be more relevant. For example, objects located on the environment and stuff. We are also currently analyzing some techniques involving uh, gaze tracking, which is the operate. we will be able to track the gaze of the operator so that we are transmitting or uh, prioritizing the information that the operator is using. So, yeah, I'm going to hand back to the studio then. So if you have any questions, happy to answer. Okay, thanks, Salvador. Um, so again, that's kind of a, a subtle detail that um, initially might not be considered is how you deal with that data because Obviously, a line of communication is vital for the, uh, the operations to go as intended. So methods to manage that over both distance and, uh, and have security and predictability of that. It's very important. Um, so we'll cut back down to the workshop where I understand everyone's ready to, uh, to do some cutting. Back to uh, into the workshop. All right. Hello. I think we'll come live in a second. If we go with roving cam, I think they've crashed. Oh. This is the joy of a live stream. Quick job, tap dance. <laughs> I'm not doing my robot dance. That's just that's just not right. <laughs> Let's do a bit of comedy improv. Actually, one of the things I will mention is um, as, I, as I discussed earlier, so with a different working group. So we had um, the the validation and autonomy group. So one of the other um, documents that's been authored that's available as a white paper on the RAIN website is when RAIN began, we recognized that it wasn't just about having the tech, it was about having it you know, in a deployable condition. And part of that is having the life cycle of the, the development process, understand that as soon as it pops out the other end as a sort of commercial entity, is it needs to be um, regulated, it needs to have regulated approval. So during the, the lifespan of RAIN, we've, we've always had this kind of open ear approach whereby we'll, uh, discuss our research uh, ambition, share that back into the industrial community and research community and say, is this the right thing to do? And as part of that, we've engaged with the Office for Nuclear Regulation, so the ONR, people in the nuclear field will be familiar with that um, acronym and team. 
Um, and we've, we've dealt with them and discussed with them kind of considerations for implementing um, autonomous systems because it's, it's not just a case of being able to do all the hardware and then plop the autonomy in at the end and everyone will be immediately satisfied. So that level of discussion is useful not only to help us um, uncover potential con um, concerns and mismatches of understanding so that we can share the kind of real, real facts are, if you like, so that we can all build from the, the kind of sh um, shared level of understanding, but also to kind of share our research and the development path plans so that we can head off any future risks and, uh, and then make sure that when things are in a um, supply chain ready condition that it, everything is there ready for them to, to move on. So take a look at white paper um, after this demo and you'll be able to see some of the considerations that we've put together and the prin principles to, um, to keep in mind for deploying autonomous systems. Are we ready to go? We are ready to go. Let's back to the workshop. All right, so we're running a little bit behind, so we'll keep this short. What you can see here is on the left, we've got an orange Dremel, we've got a flexible att attachment to us, and this just gives us a lot more flexibility of not having to deal with a heavy tool and how that limits our motion. Other thing you'll notice, we've maneuvered fairly quickly. We, it'd be nice to have it in the corner, see how quick, but never mind. Into this location with the elbow against the floor, that just gives us an extra level of stiffness. So if we want to start cutting, we'll just do a bit. Dremel's on. Again, we've got a nice, control over it because the robot is easy to control and we can start rotating fairly quickly. Can we see the sparks on the camera? I can't tell. Oh, yeah. Kind of. Yep. And we can start cutting through the metal fairly quickly. Back through the first section, just pull back, let's rotate around. Go this way. Just take a moment. So again, this is one of the benefits of the robots is that we have a, a level of control over them that's quite good. Yeah, you can see it's comes attached, can't you? All right. I should have sped up the speed, but again, we can adjust the speed and the quality of the cut based on the precision. We've downed the, the speed of any motions. And that just means we can get in Start cutting. Let's we'll see if we can get through the whole of the tin. So I think this is clearly the pinnacle of the uh, the live demonstration of, of watching a robot slowly cut through a metallic container. Uh, it's nice to see the spark. Oh, <laughs> That's very good. Are we, uh, have we got a plan to uh, sweep up that debris underneath, Guy? Yeah, let's, let's go with that then. So let's place this down. In the meantime, Prodder, do you want to talk about your collision avoidance? And we'll just start putting some of this stuff away. Right. So, I have two sheets. Do you want to throw the camera under the screen for a second? Yes, yes. That would be nice. So here we are uh, trying to avoid the obstacles and we uh, add this as an additional criteria to the IK. If you point to the video, here you can see there is a possible collision with this arm movement with this ball. But if we do a collision avoidance, the arm uh, avoids the ball. So this collision avoidance is coming through a neural network and the neural network actually is trained to give the cost of collision. Uh, it estimates it and that cost of collision is added as an additional uh, criteria to the least square IK so that uh, the ball avoids it. So again, in the least square, after the least square IK, now you can see the arm avoids the ball, which was supposed to collide. Now, in addition to it, uh, we have also used the manipulability criteria and the collision avoidance criteria both together uh, in the same IK so that uh, we can have a balance of the manipul manipulability and also the arm avoids the ball or avoids any obstacle in its path. So here the, uh, we demonstrate this. You see it uses the manipulability and the, also the collision avoidance to uh, 
get to this position. So it's the three comparisons together. The least squared IK, the collision avoidance, and the multi-criteria IK is the collision avoidance. Now, this is a static obstacle. Now, if we see the dynamic obstacle case, if this is for just for research purpose, that if there is an obstacle which is also dynamic inside the glove box, this algorithm can also avoid it. You can see the two videos here. So here the ball just moves in between the arm which was supposed to collide. So the ball is moving and also the arm is moving. So here what we are trying to achieve is we get a good amount of manipulability and also the neural network gives the estimated cost of collision which also drives the IK. So the arm together maintaining its manipulability can avoid the obstacle whether it is static or dynamic so that is what we are trying to demonstrate here in the simulation brilliant thank you frogger thank you. uh it's one of the reasons why we've done in that simulation is because it's actually quite hard to visualize what's going on if it was inside the glove box it looked like it was just magically working whereas what you're seeing there big red ball falling through the air gives a very clear demonstration but it does work on the real data with large amount of point clouds throwing through it that's the benefit of using a uh, a neural network technique for this and it's also then extending what Ozan was doing in that multi-criteria multi IK to try and keep those elbows if someone dropped a, a hammer near you you would naturally move your elbows out of the way so that's kind of what's going on there also avoiding the outer hull of the glove box so you're not constantly slamming against it so if we move to have a look inside the glove box we're going to start doing a quick operation I think John if you want to start doing questions or discussion while I'm doing this and we leave this camera running, that might work quite well. So people can watch yep. and talk at the same time. That sounds good. Um, yeah, we've got a good feed coming in from the uh, robots interacting with the, uh, oh, the the glamorous snake hose, no expense spared. Um, so we just had a, a couple of um, questions in the chat. One, Erwin's politely answered, but I'll just um, cover that for anyone who's missed them. So we've got about what control method is employed, um, PID, question mark, and then the response, if you can pop that one up. Firm replied with the low level, low, low level motor control is usually PID, but we put our own controllers on top of them to make it safer and more responsive. So again, that kind of taps into the the, um, the kind of trust and predictability perspective of while um, either balance between autonomous or manual operations, um, you want to make sure that obviously everything's in as uh, safe a configuration as possible. So that we've kind of discussed earlier about um, the, the uh, influence of collisions or the robots touching each other, but obviously touching the environment. So there's an element sort of in this, obviously, research glove box where there's an amount of um, disturbance, annoyance caused if things collide with each other or into the glove box containment um, and any damage caused therein. But we recognize that if you have that sort of um, uh, scenario occurring in a real new glove box, then, then that's a whole world of pain that, that you don't want to get into. So there's of uh, safeguarding to make sure that um, the, the safe operating envelope is well understood so that we need to, um, to have those eventualities and, uh, and that things can perform safely and appropriately. So we've just got a bit of a, a bit of motion going on there, that's all good. So we're installing a jacket so uh, Hoover. Yep, so we've got the um, the adapter gone into the corner, and then the next motion will be to plug that in and move that on. We'd have a quick question about whether this event is recorded. Will be recorded. It is recorded right now, and then as the uh, broadcast is finished, we have to share that on our um, our YouTube page. That's no excuse for you to leave, though. So, because uh, uh, I'm sure things are getting super exciting as soon as the vacuum is plugged in, because nobody's ever seen the vacuum used or in a nuclear box. No, no, everyone is good to this guy. This is, this is clearly the fireworks. This has been the uh, parallel for it. As you can see, as well, near the end of the, uh, if you like, those, those um, group of blocks as well, so they can interact appropriately.
Okay, so if we just hold for a second, you want to show Bashir's stuff for a moment? So, yeah, so we'll cover that in a second. So, um, as we know, this is a, this is a live demo. Sometimes don't, things don't go quite as you'd expect. Well, that's part of the research, right? So it's dealing with kind of uh, unexpected events. So in, in normal operations, you get this kind of failure recovery mode, okay? So when things don't yeah, um, get into that zone where things aren't as you'd like. You need a method of being able to recover from that. Obviously, in a research environment, it's relatively easy and convenient to be able to quickly turn things off, disconnect things, and, and, and set things back up again. In a real operating environment, you might, have, might, not, might not have that convenience. So the ability to fail predictably and fail safely is something else that's um, it's a little bit sort of longer down our journey. But it is equally important, again, having that sort of trust and predictability so that once you've sort of defined the, the mission, if you like, uh, which while in a, a remote inspection um, capacity. So if you're sending a robot off to, to rove and return data, that kind of mission connotation sounds quite good because you've got that kind of journey and transition. But if you've got the same glove box environment, you've still got an environment, things to do in that space, a, um, a de defined or to be defined start condition and a desirable end condition, and any deviations from that need to be managed so that you're still maintaining that safety and predictability. So all the learning that we gather through the research hiccups, if you like, and, and, uh, and minor setbacks, all informs that kind of future position so that you get a, a better and rob more robust um, solution down, down the road. Are we ready to, um, to share somebody else? We are. Right, we've currently got um, the perceptions information being shared this is good hello do you want to hello you yes. are back with us yep we can hear you now hello. you are back. all right we'll just do a little bit of cleaning up to finish off and then we'll talk to Bashir so if you want to share roving cam or something else there you go yeah let's do it just where I need it wait a second so this is where the applause comes in right So what you can see is obviously, again, safe manipulation of tools going forward. Now, instead of using this tool, if you want to turn off, what we can do is talk about Bashir's tool handling. So if you want to roving cam around to this side quickly. Yeah, over it. Hello. So um, about cleaning, you saw uh, an operation of vacuum, yeah. but uh, there is other oper other cleaning operation that uh, the glove box, the robot and the glove box will perform. And one of these tasks is uh, brushing and collect all the dust uh, for the dustpan. So uh, the idea is to uh, mount uh, this kind of uh, soft hand uh, on the robot and um, and um, sensorize uh, the tool, the brush. Uh, in order to uh, control the robot softly, uh, like that, it will um, compensate uh, the, um, the compliance of the system. So uh, the idea is to have a soft and um, a smooth control in order to uh, collect the dust uh, correctly and efficiently. So, yeah, brilliant. So that's some of the current research. We'll just show a bit of tidying up and just slowly try to post out some of this. So there's excess tube that we don't need. I shouldn't have tried a tube. The tube's a bit overconfident. How's it gone in? Might look slightly. All right, so we'll just have to hold here for a second while I do a bit. Again, we can see the level of dexterity we're getting out of that robot is quite high. Being able to get quite high into that port, then up. Closing the port down, and then I can. My eyes. There we go. Getting into a situation where we're slowly screwing up. I have to think righty tighty, lefty loosey. Again, we can probably get the robot to do this automatically, so I don't have to say righty tighty outside. There we go. 
we've posted out the tubes, we've posted out everything we need to, we've tidied up, we've done some cutting, we've shown off everything we'd like to. John, do you want to describe in the studio? Thank you, Guy. That's really good. So I'll just do a, a quick run through. So we'll, um, yeah, we'll have the applause in a moment. So we've, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how to top the uh, the vacuum operation. That was that was a highlight for me. Um, so yeah, so we we got to the inspection, um, bit of sorting, bit of a description of the sweeping operations, um, the data compression discussion, the importance of being in as um, free a position as possible, so that it doesn't lock up. So that when the operator or autonomous operation wants to move to the next step, it's got as much freedom as possible to move. And that's one of the considerations as well is the uh, people say tech and people think technology and hardware, but it's the techniques as well. So the algorithms behind, uh, behind the hardware and, and just the mindsets as well that come in. So one of the things that's really advantageous in RAIN is not just the different institutions, so the different geographies uh, and the cultures they're in, but also the different researchers and, and different contributors because everyone's got a different perspective, got different geographical kind of references and cultures coming into the mix. So you get that kind of melting pot of different ideas. So when you want to come to the different techniques behind the scenes, you get a real variety of, of um, applications and ideas. So it gives you some, uh, some really good, uh, good stuff to chew on and, and try out. Um, we've seen the, uh, yeah, the data compression discussion and the uh, premise of the, the long distance communication. Again, this was something we trialed, um, just doing it in, like, as a prep for the live session. But uh, again, it, it comes down to that sort of network reliance. So it, it's good that we sort of do those um, pre-live trials so that, you, that we can then feed that back to us and say, look, if you're doing this sort of thing, this is the thing to, to consider. So as one of the um, uh, measures of success, if you like, for AIN, it's about transferring that knowledge, not just amongst the research community, but sharing it out. So thank you again for viewing online sharing it out to people who are viewing, whether from a research, industrial perspective, uh, members of the, the public who are interested, so we can share what we've, we've learned so that other things can improve as well, so that everything doesn't need to effectively learn from our own mistakes. We can share our own mistakes, and you don't have to, to go through that circuit again. So we've gone through a very um, quick overview of starting things, doing operations, closing things up at the very end. Um, I'll just do a, a little bit of a, a quick um, thing for the uh, uh, Ryan admin, if you like. So our, ne our next event is on the 7th of October. We've got a web of Shadow Robotics. If you're not familiar with them, they're uh, experts in actual um, uh, dexterous hand manipulability. They've got um, in impressive robot hands. So they'll be with uh, us on the webinar on 7th of October. So do join for that. If you're not a member of the Ryan uh, mailing list already, and, and why not, then go over to uh, or email us at info at ryanhub.org.uk uh, or go to the website and scroll down the page and uh, add, add uh, the newsletter to your feed, and then you'll get notifications of events like this. Um, what next for Ryan? So the demonstration you've seen, obviously, we've got lots of different institutions. We've got people physically and virtually from Manchester, Rice, uh, contributions from Oxford and Nottingham as well. We've still not integrated everything in Rain. So as I mentioned before, phase one was up until March this year. Phase two runs from April, so we're in the middle of phase two until March next year. And then we'll see what uh, is installed right after that. But we've still got in, uh, technology to integrate and techniques to integrate. So uh, particularly from Reading, so they've got some very interesting devices, which we'll, we'll keep our powder dry on that. But they've got some really interesting contributions to make. We've got um, we've managed to get through all this so far, not mention the Race Cortex system. That is the interoperable framework that allows effectively plug and play. It, it, it's it's a, a spiel in itself, but Cortex to integrate as well, which will give us great value. Uh, and broader simulation tools as well. So there's still more to come in our next demonstrations. So again, thank you online for watching. Thank you for all the researchers down for the, the preparation uh, over the last few weeks, both in terms of the stuff that's just been here and, and elsewhere. Thank you for our live audience here. If you've enjoyed what you've seen, if you, if you want to put your hands together, that's totally up to you. That's, that's your cue to give a bit of love for the... Brilliant. Um, thank you on the chat for all the questions, and uh, and we'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll give a signal, and then the end broadcast button will be clicked, and uh, and then that'll do us for today. So thank you again for your time. <laughs>